Thanks, guys. That was awesome. I just want you to imagine just being in the vicinity of the birth of Jesus. There's a crying baby. I know one of the old songs says, the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. But I like to think that he cried good. Nothing, nothing wrong with a good cry. Shows a healthy baby. And, um, and the Magi or the wise men or the astrologers or whatever, there's a lot we don't know about the Magi, but these men that were drawn to the birth of Jesus on that night, um, one of the lines that Alyssa just sang was Jesus, he was Lord at, his, at, Lord at birth. It's an amazing picture that people, Jesus' own mother, the wise men, shepherds, they came and they worshipped him at his birth. And these wise men, they came and they brought gifts. And they said in Matthew chapter 2, we've come to worship him. We've come to worship him. And I wonder sometimes if there's a simplicity to worshipping Jesus as King and Lord. Because when we remember him as King and Lord, and particularly as King, that actually as these wise men came and they brought gifts, it is something that you would really only do for royalty. It was, it's something that you would only do for someone that is of so esteem and has such a high office that this child has not done a thing except cry and breathe and potentially breastfeed. Kids don't do much more than that. If you don't know, spend time around a newborn. They cry and they sleep and they sleep and they cry and they go to the toilet. There's not much else that they do. And this child was worshipped. He was a king and he lived his identity as a king in a very different way to any king in history. And we believe as Christians that in the words of scriptures on many occasions, I think in 1 Timothy, on multiple occasions in the book of Revelation, Jesus is referred to not just as king, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And that there is a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is Lord of all. And what that's talking about is every king and every queen will one day bow down to him. And many have, even in our world today. Kings and queens do bow down to him. Silent Night's a fantastic song. Another great song is Joy to the World. On the way to the early service this morning, I was singing it in the car and... Um, it was really bad, but I, I felt the vibe, so I went with it. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Isn't that good? There's this picture that Jesus is king of the world, and it is up to the world to either accept that they have a king or not. If there is a king of the world, it's not a question of, okay, it's like, are you going to catch up with this picture that there is a Lord of Lords, there is a King of Kings, and at Christmas time, what better time to say, I am going to accept and receive my king. Because when a king or a queen walks into the room, you have a choice to receive that king or queen or to reject that king or queen. Even though they may have the office, they may have the authority, you can accept or you can reject. Now in a lot of cases, if you reject the king or the queen, you'll be killed. <laughs> but this joyful song is saying that we have a good king. Will the whole world receive her king. I love her at shopping malls right across the world. People are singing, let earth receive her king. Do you know what you're singing? Do you really want Jesus? Why don't you just receive him here in the shopping mall? You're singing it, so just go with it. And then it goes on to say, verse 2, joy to the world, the Saviour reigns. I love this. People are saying, we need a Saviour. We have a Saviour. His name is Jesus. And He hasn't just helped us. He hasn't just saved us. But He is reigning. He is ruling. And He has authority. And He has power. And He 
is the one that is in the controls. He's reigning. Isn't that good? That people right across the world are singing the gospel even if they don't know it. I believe Paul says in Philippians that it doesn't matter what the motives are as long as the gospel's being preached. That's the, the main thing. Sometimes people sing these songs with not the best motives, not even the understanding of the gospel, but I believe that the power of the gospel can still go out through the Christmas season, through these amazing songs. And the third verse says, He rules the world with truth and grace. These are people, like you and me, that don't want anyone ruling us. Who are you to tell me what to do with my life? Who are you to tell me how I should live out my relationships? Who are you to tell me what I should do with my money? Who are you to tell me about my priorities? Well, you're singing that he rules the world with truth and grace. That there is someone that has truth to speak into my situation, who has a picture of truth, the whole perspective of the horizon he sees. And he's not just a truth teller, and he doesn't just lead with truth, but he's also gracious. I think it's really important at Christmas time that we remember that Jesus is king. I think the main, one of the main reasons is because in the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, that it was never about an ethnic saviour for a minority people group. It was always that through the Jewish Messiah, the light to the nations would come and that God would bring restoration, justice and righteousness to the whole world. That Jesus wasn't the plan B, Jesus is the plan A. He is the purpose of God in history. He is the one, the common thread throughout all of the Bible. The story of the Bible is about Jesus from creation to recreation. Now, I think the first, one of the first things I want to say about the importance of knowing Jesus as king is that a king, number one, has power and authority over all other powers and all other authorities. Jesus the king has power and authority over all other powers and authorities. I want you to think about systems, structures, powers and authorities in our world. I want you to think about governments. I want you to think about politics. I want you to think about bureaucracies. I want you to think about your own life. I want you to think about your sinful patterns of your life. I want you to think about habits and patterns and destructive thoughts. I want you to think about the toxic effects of brokenness in relationships that even though we try and even though we strive, there's a brokenness in the human condition that affects me, it affects us and it affects our world. And that there are some things that seem so powerful. The wealthy in our worlds get wealthier. Those with power have more power. And those with less power seem like they are more and more forgotten. That Jesus the King has power and authority over all other powers and authorities. You know, have you ever heard this, the saying, it was over before it began? Have you ever played a sporting competition and you looked at the competition and you thought, this is over. We have got nothing. It's like you're playing soccer and you line up against, it's like the Seton CFC B team lines up against Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, Luis Suarez. That's the front three. And we just look at each other, the, the CFC B team. I wouldn't make the B team, I might, might make the D team. And, um, and we just look at each other and, and we just go, it's over before it begins. Unless they want to be very, very charitable, it's over. I remember one of the funniest YouTube things to check out when you're wanting to waste time at work, um, which none of you ever do. Um, Google Mal Meninga press conference. Mal Meninga used to be the captain of the Australian rugby league team. He was the captain of um, Queensland. Um, rugby league team as well and he, he made this big announcement he's going to run for politics and all of the media assembled in Canberra for this press uh, this announcement and uh, for this media conference and he sat down and he started talking about his passion for politics and to change the society and his service to the community his beliefs and his values and about halfway through his paragraph he stumbled upon a few words and he realised he was starting to talk like a politician and he couldn't get the words out and he just says I can't do this. And he threw his hands up in the air and he walked out of the press conference. 
And that was the end of his political career. He actually ended his career as he was announcing it. Mel Meningo, great footballer, not a great politician. Um, it was over before it began. You know, I think that our King, Jesus, he has ultimate authority over all other authorities. You know, my some, have you ever been around people that think that they've got authority, but they don't really? Um, I know a four-year-old called Josiah, and he thinks that he has authority. So what he'll do is, if he thinks I've been treating him unjustly, he'll stand there and he'll say, Daddy, go to your room now! I'm very unhappy with you! That's his, that's his favourite little saying at the moment. Go to your room now! I'm very unhappy with you! And I just think it's the cutest thing. So I just smile at him and want to kiss him. And um, that doesn't, I think that undermines his sense of authority. Uh, and now um, this morning, just this morning, my two-year-old Jude said, go to room now! And I'm thinking, are you telling me to go to my room? And, and this is, and it's amazing, the same words can be said, but if you don't have authority, the words don't mean the same. I think the authority of King Jesus is that ultimately, if we believe that a transcendent God created everything, and he is not only um, the creator and the sustainer, but he is present in our world and he is bringing our whole world to its completion, and he is going to make a new heavens and a new earth, and he has a goal for everything, then when he speaks, speaks as king, he has authority over all the other voices that would come against his voice. I think the psalm that encapsulates this perfectly is Psalm 2. It's a messianic prophecy in the Old Testament. Let's read it together. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed so this is a picture of all of the powers and all of the empires and all of the leaders of the world gathering together against the Lord, the God of Israel, and his anointed one. And when you hear language of anointing, it's anointing has to do with setting people apart. So in the Old Testament, the people that were anointed were kings and were, uh, and were prophets. They were anointed kings and prophets and priests. And so... Um, so, so against the Lord and his anointed one and, and anointed one in the New Testament when whenever you read about Christ Christ means Messiah which means anointed one so Christ is the Greek version of Messiah the Jewish, sorry, Messiah which is the, the Hebrew rendering of the anointed one of Israel so whenever you see Jesus Christ it means Jesus the Jewish Messiah Jesus the anointed one of Israel. And so it's pretty amazing that there's this picture in this prophetic psalm. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed one, the Messiah. Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. How about your laugh? Hey, it's good for the soul. The Lord scoffs at them. It, it, it's even more profound than me laughing at my four-year-old son trying to tell me off. The power differential is even greater than when God looks at the supposed power and authority of the rules of this world. He laughs and it's like Crocodile Dundee. That's not a knife. This is a knife. It's like God is not intimidated by the loud and the violent and the abusive power structures in this world because there is a king above all kings and he reigns. He says, it says verse 5, he rebuked them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. Nothing better than terrifying a bully, amen? When you see something turned around on someone that feels like they've got the power. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are a son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I make the nations your inheritance and the, uh, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. What a powerful psalm. Why do kings have power and authority? 
Well, because they're not appointed by politicians and factions in the Liberal Party and the Labour Party. The King or Queen of England is set apart from the political process and they are not said to be appointed by man, they are thought to be anointed by God. And so while politicians come and go in England, Philip Bryce did account for me before, he reckons there's been 12 um, Prime Ministers of, of Great Britain during the time that Queen Elizabeth has reigned. Now I'm going to do you all a favour. If you're looking for a great television show to watch on Netflix, it's called The Crown. Has anyone watched it? Am I lying? It's awesome. It's actually a fantastic show. It's an insight into her rise to power as a young woman, really ahead of time what she expected and what everyone else expected. And it's amazing that at her coronation, there's this massive ceremony and it was broadcast across the BBC and across the world, but there was a part of the ceremony that they did not show and that was the holy anointing with oil by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Because that was seen as being so sacred because she was not put there by any politician or by any um, manoeuvre, she was put there by divine appointment. That's what they believed. And she is not subject to votes. She is not subject to elections. She is the, 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 the uh, monarch under the authority of God. And I think that is pretty impressive. And um, there's a great little scene in The Crown when Winston Churchill, the great thunderous authoritative leader of the, the man that saved Britain from fascism, as he liked to say over and over again, that she had people coming up to her saying, you need to, you need to basically give Winston Churchill the sack. That even the most powerful man in the land can get sacked by her if she wanted to, but she chose not to. And so she had authority and power over the other authorities and over the other powers. And her reign lasted long beyond the reigns of other prime ministers. I think it's really interesting when you look in the scriptures that there's this picture in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 24 to 28 and it says this, the end will come when he hands over the kingdom, this is Jesus, to God the Father. So every king needs a kingdom. And what's the kingdom? It's, it's the people of God. And the, he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So there's this sense that Jesus was king when he was born. He was king when he died on a cross, on that king's cross. He was king when he rose again, but his implementing of, of, of bringing the kingdom under his power is being slowly extended. So you can have a king or a queen that oversees a kingdom, but some people in that kingdom might not be living under the reign and rule of that king. They might be living apart from the reign and rule and laws of that king. And this picture is that Jesus is actually bringing all things under his authority. And he is destroying any dominion, any authority, or any power that would come against him. And the final enemy that he will defeat and destroy once and for all is death. So the first thing that I really want to bring out is that Jesus, King Jesus has a power and authority over all other powers and all other authorities. So when he speaks a word, when you read a promise of scripture, when you believe something by faith, I believe in God the Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe that God is three in one, I believe that I will be resurrected, I will have a new body, that you don't just believe that because it's a wishful thinking, hopes from some metaphysical kind of potential God out in the universe, that you actually believe that God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords has spoken and I can take his word to the bank because he has authority even over my mind and even over my concept of truth and reality. Secondly, King Jesus secures our future. 
Your future is not based upon your superannuation levels. Praise God. Your future is not built upon, your future security is not built upon your portfolio of housing and properties. Praise God. Your future is not built upon your own righteousness and your own goodness. Praise God. I want you to tell the person next to you that he's got this. Sometimes that's all you want to hear. Someone's got this. What is happening in our world? What is happening in our family? What is happening in our lives? I want you to know today that there is a king who's got this. He is outside of time. He is in the future already. He is saying, it's okay. I'm not surprised. I've got this. Doesn't mean that he looks at what is in our present. Doesn't mean he looks at the evil and the suffering and likes it, but he says, I have got this. I have a plan and I have secured and guaranteed the future. I believe that Jesus, the reason why he's often referred to as light in the Bible is because light is just the most beautiful image that illustrates the authority of light over darkness. The light cannot be turned out. Have you ever walked into a room with a little candle? And it can be a massive room with a little candle, but there there is an inevitability that the power of that little candle will have power over the darkness wherever you take that candle, no matter how small the candle. This morning I woke up at 5 a.m., and there was darkness all outside. But that there was an inevitability that the light would come. Do you know what I love about mornings? Is when the light comes, when it starts shining through the blinds, there is an inevitability that the light will only increase and not diminish. And this morning I just, I'm looking outside and part of me was thinking I want the light to hold off because I want to snooze on the couch some more because I can't go back to my bed because I've got two boys in my bed and they're going to kick me in the face some more. But I thought I might be able to get another half an hour on the couch and I was kind of annoyed that the light was coming but there's a problem with the light in the morning is it doesn't decrease, it just increases. Do you know what I mean? So you can try to hit the snooze button as many times, but the light will come. And that is a picture of light and the darkness. The darkness will not overcome the light. The darkness will never overcome the light. There's inevitability to the light. And that's what I think about Paul in Philippians 1.21 when he says, hey, it's whether I live or die, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's this sense that no matter what happens, my light, the light that has been lit by Jesus and the gospel and new life, will not be snuffed out. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read about these people that have lived wonderful lives and passed away, but that there is a sense that their light was still shining. And their light still shines today because they are alive with Jesus and we still talk about them 2,000 years later because their light will not be diminished. We are the light of the world because we have Jesus, the light of the world, in us. And light will not be overcome by darkness. Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7, this great prophecy, it says this, For us, to us a child is born. A son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. Isn't that good that there is a day coming where all authority and all politics and all government will be on the shoulders of Jesus and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Can everyone say no end? He will reign over David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. This is the good news. When Jesus reigns on his throne, there is no end to his justice and his righteousness. His rule, our future, is not one of anxiety. It is not one of saying, okay, God has been gracious, but now we're just waiting for the next bad thing to happen. Have you ever felt like that? Yeah, life's going pretty good at the moment, but there's, oh yeah, 
it's only a matter of time before someone gets sick or between I have a financial hardship in my business or before I have a relational um, difficult time. No, what God is doing and what God has done in Jesus and what he's going to do in the new heavens and the new earth is he has secured our future so that we don't have to live with anxiety, that we can live with a hope of a kingdom of righteousness and justice and peace and happiness and it will not end. And the greatness of his government and his peace, there will be no end. I think that is something that gives incredible hope. I love it in Revelation 11 verse 15. It says, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. You know, some of you kids out there, you'll learn the song one day. That there are powers and there are authorities that seem evil, but all of those have been put to the side and the kingdom and the reign and the rule of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah and he will reign forever and ever. I think it's wonderful news that King Jesus has secured your future and my future. Don't be anxious about the future. Don't be anxious about where you're going. Don't be anxious about the justice and the goodness and the righteousness of God. He's secured your future. Just this week, we've had the very sad news and I want to bring commiserations and our love to the family of, well, the whole Wabnitz family. Um, just this week, just this week, we've had um, the incredibly sad news of Helen Wabnitz going to be with Jesus. And it's rare that in a church life that you have someone that is so, you know, uh, when Pastor Bill talks about the whole Wabnitz family, I don't know if you noticed last week, he was drawn to tears. And we as a church are so, we, we will always honour those that are um, pillars in the life of the church. The church wouldn't be what it is without the pillars and without those that others have built upon. And we look at our facility, would not be here without the Wabnitz family. And we just want to pass on our love to the whole family. And we are with you, and we are grieving with you, but we do not grieve without hope. We actually grieve, and we also have joy and celebration at the same time. Because our future hope is secured. Our future hope is secured. And we are so thankful that right now she's in the presence of Jesus without spot or blemish or wrinkle or disease or infection or pain or tear. And um, we would, as a church, we would invite you to come to the, the funeral service here on Saturday at 11 o'clock. And you're welcome to come and we will um, grieve and mourn and also celebrate together as church family with the Wabnitz family. And so I often to say, I don't know how people do life without Jesus. Do you ever feel like that? I think that's how we should feel. Because I don't know how people do life without Jesus. I'm so thankful that Helen's future is secured and she's not anxious. And at this time, we do also pray for the whole family that during this whole season, and Christmas is a very difficult time for many of us. I look around this room and I know I, I could... Actually, if probably about every second or third person, I could say Christmas is a really painful time for you because of people you have lost. And at this Christmas time, I hope that tinged in with the grief and the sadness, there is also joy and hope because you have a wonderful king who is presiding over the whole thing. So we do invite you, church family, to come to the, uh, the funeral, the memorial at 11am here on Saturday. 
Also, I want to finish with this. King Jesus, he hasn't just secured the future. He doesn't just have ultimate authority. But he alone has the power to sacrifice like no other. Imagine if a king or queen was to sacrifice all of their wealth. That would be a far greater sacrifice than me sacrificing all of my wealth. Do you know the reason why? I don't have a lot of wealth. (laughs) And there's certain sacrifices that only a king or queen can make. Jesus, in the scriptures, is the true anointed shepherd king. We see a mirror of that in the Old Testament of King David before he's a king. And he leads the people of God. And he leads them um, against the, the giant Goliath. And he kills Goliath with a stone. And he leads his people to victory. But Jesus does something even greater. He doesn't just lead his people to victory, although he has done that through his life, death, and resurrection. But he leads, he, he leads his people as a servant, and he doesn't just give of sacrifice and of courageous leadership. He actually fights with his own life. He is the true anointed shepherd king, and when he goes out to fight Goliath or any other enemy, he actually gives over his body. He gives over his life. And he is sacrificed in the most terrible way so that his men and his women following him would not have to die that same death. You know, I often think of David and Goliath. You know, David fought the battle that none of the other men would fight. But Jesus died the death that we should have died so that we wouldn't have to. He is the ultimate, true, anointed shepherd king. In the same way that David was anointed and set apart by God through the prophet Samuel, Jesus too was anointed. He was set apart. But with Jesus, there was no great royal coronation. There was no 24-hour streaming of the event on satellite television. There was no pomp and ceremony. When you watch this show that I was telling you about, you you see the royal coronation. It was amazing. It was designed to make people see this young woman and be in awe of her office, awe of her power, in awe of her transcendence. She had a high-profile anointing. She had a high-profile celebration. She had a crown of jewels put on her head. And she had shouts of joy from the crowds. But when King Jesus came, there was no royal coronation like that. There was no high profile anointing in front of all the people. There was no crown of jewels, but there was a crown of thorns. And there was no shouts of joy from the crowds, but there was shouts of mocking and abuse and hatred. That is the path that King Jesus took to be for his people, the true anointed shepherd king. I was thinking about Jesus' anointing that when he was set apart, when he was anointed, there's, there's, a, there's one example of him being anointed in the scriptures and it's actually present in all four gospels. And generally when someone, a story is present in all four gospels, you, you need to take note because there's only a handful of things that that's true of. Like there's only, I think the feeding of the 5,000 is one of the only miracles that's listed in all four Gospels. Um, so some of the Gospels choose to emphasize different parts of Jesus' story. But one of the stories that is recorded in all four Gospels is the anointing of Jesus. And we're going to just read one of those accounts in John chapter 12 as we finish. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of, of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet 
and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You see, this story mentioned in all four Gospels is a story of extravagance. This is as close you get to an extravagant moment for Jesus where there is lavish worship poured out upon him and he did not push it away, he received it. And in the story here we have Mary, she pours out this beautiful perfume worth a year's wages. So let's just call it $50,000. That's a lot of money. I mean, for what it's worth, if any of you want to give me a $50,000 bottle of perfume, I would just prefer the money, okay? I'm just throwing it out there, okay? Just throwing it out there. But maybe that's just me. Maybe you would like to be indulged and, and have, have $50,000 worth of perfume put over your, your body. But this woman didn't just anoint and cover his feet with the oil. In a couple of the other Gospels, it actually says that his head was anointed with oil as well. And the context seems to give us this impression that, that, that it was a whole bodily anointing, so she, and she had enough oil for that. And, and, and the perfume was actually imported from India. It was, it was very precious. So just imagine, imagine if it wasn't just his feet, because I think you, you would only do that to someone, not only pour expensive oil, uh, perfume on his feet, but then whip out your hair, and as a woman in that culture, you never took out your hair. So you risked social shame because of your love and worship and adoration. And she started to cover his feet with her hair and wash his feet. And imagine if she anointed his head and his whole body was dripping with this perfume. And everyone's just looking, thinking, what are you doing, man? Stop this woman. Think of the killed children. Think of the money. Do something else with this. And what does he say? And Judas is there. Filthy, dirty Judas. Oh, this could have gone to the poor. I mean, gee whiz, Judas. You see, Judas, the one that was about to betray Jesus, was undermining the woman that was preparing Jesus for his death, that was going to be set up by Judas. And you see, Jesus says that she is preparing me for my burial. But you know what I believe? It wasn't just preparing for a burial. It was actually a symbol that he was, to be, he was anointed as a king. But he was to express his kingly reign and rule through giving his life for his people. He was to be not just the powerful king, not just the king of kings, but the servant king. And she understood. She bowed her knee and she worshipped at his feet and she anointed him. He exercised his role as a king by giving away his power, by seeking and saving those that were lost and by dying a criminal's death on a cross. So that all those, even those that were killing him on that Christ, might receive life and life evermore. Can I invite you just to stand to your feet and close your eyes?